Hello again, boys and girls. My name is Miss Gale, and I'm here today to read for you chapters 9 and 10 of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Last time we were reading, um, Ron and Harry had just had tea with Hagrid and filled him in on all of their first lessons and how it had gone. Harry didn't get along very well with one of his professors, Professor Snape, but he can't really figure out why Snape doesn't seem to like him. And we found out a little bit more about the break-in at Gringotts. And Gringotts, if you remember, is the Witches and Wizards Bank. And Harry is wondering if the thing that Hagrid took out of the bank might actually have been the thing that the thieves were trying to steal. So, chapter 9 is titled, The Midnight Duel. Harry had never believed he would meet a boy he hated more than Dudley but that was before he met Draco Malfoy. Still, first year Gryffindors only had potions with the Slytherins, so they didn't have to put up with Malfoy much. Or at least they didn't until they spotted a notice pinned up in the Gryffindor common room, which made them all groan. Flying lessons would be starting on Thursday and Gryffindor and Slytherin would be learning together. Typical, said Harry darkly, just what I always wanted, to make a fool of myself on a broomstick in front of Malfoy. He had been looking forward to learning to fly more than anything else. You don't know you'll make a fool of yourself, said Ron reasonably. Anyway, I know Malfoy is always going on about how good he is at Quidditch, but I bet that's all talk. Malfoy certainly did talk about flying a lot. He complained loudly about first years never getting on the house Quidditch team and told long boastful stories which always seemed to end with him narrowly escaping muggles in helicopters. He wasn't the only one though. The way Seamus Finnegan told it, he'd spent most of his childhood zooming around the countryside on his broomstick. Even Ron would tell anyone who'd listen about the time he almost hit a hang glider on Charlie's old broom. Everyone from wizarding families talked about Quidditch constantly. Ron had already had a big argument with Dean Thomas, who shared their dormitory, about football. Ron couldn't see what was exciting about a game with only one ball where no one was allowed to fly. Harry had caught Ron prodding Dean's poster of West Ham football team trying to make the players move. Neville had never been on a broomstick in his life, because his grandmother had never let him near one. Privately, Harry felt she'd had a good reason because Neville managed to have an extraordinary number of accidents even with both feet on the ground. Hermione Granger was almost as nervous about flying as Neville was. This was something she, you couldn't learn by heart out of a book, not that she hadn't tried. At breakfast on Thursday, she'd bored them all stupid with flying tips she got out of a library book called Quidditch Through the Ages. Neville was hanging on to her every word, desperate for anything that might help him hang on to his broomstick later, but everybody else was very pleased when Hermione's lecture was interrupted by the arrival of the post. Harry hadn't had a single letter since Hagrid's note, something that Malfoy had been quick to notice, of course. Malfoy's eagle owl was always bringing him packages of sweets from home, which he opened gloatingly at the Slytherin table. A barn owl brought Neville a small package from his grandmother. He opened it excitedly and showed them a glass ball the size of a large marble, which seemed to be full of white smoke. It's a remember all, he explained. Grand knows I forget things. This tells you if there's something you've forgotten to do. Look, you hold it tight like this, and if it turns red, oh, his face fell because the remember all had suddenly glowed scarlet. You've forgotten something. Neville was trying to remember what he'd forgotten when Draco Malfoy, who was passing the Gryffindor table, snatched the remember-all out of his hand. Harry and Ron jumped to their feet. They were half hoping for a reason to fight Malfoy, but Professor McGonagall, who could spot trouble quicker than any teacher in the school, was there in a flash. What's going on? Malfoy's got my rem remember-all, Professor. Scowling, Malfoy quickly dropped the remember-all back on the table. Just looking, he said, and he slipped away with Crabbe and Goyle behind him. At 3.30 that afternoon, 
Harry, Ron, and the other Gryffindors hurried down the front step into the grounds for their first flying lesson. It was a clear, breezy day, and the grass rippled under their feet as they marched down the slopey lawns towards a smooth lawn on the opposite side of the grounds to the Forbidden Forest, whose trees were swaying darkly in the distance. The Slytherins were already there, and so were twenty broomsticks lying in neat lines on the ground. Harry had heard Fred and George Weasley complain about the school brooms, saying that some of them started to vibrate if you flew too high, or always flew slightly to the left. Their teacher, Madame Hooch, arrived. She had short gray hair and yellow eyes like a hawk. Well, what are y'all waiting for, she barked. Everyone stand by a broomstick. Come on, hurry up. Harry glanced down at his broom. It was old and some of the twigs stuck out at odd angles. Stick out your right hand over the broom, called Madame Hooch up at the front. And say up. Up, everyone shouted. Harry's broom jumped into his hand at once, but it was one of the few that did. Hermione Granger's had simply rolled over on the ground and Neville's hadn't moved at all. Perhaps brooms, like horses, could tell when you were afraid, thought Harry. There was a quaver in Neville's voice that was only too clearly that he wanted to keep his feet on the ground. Madame Hooch then showed them how to mount their brooms without sliding off the end and walked up and down the rows, correcting their grips. Harry and Ron were delighted when she told Malfoy he'd been doing it wrong for years. Now, when I blow my whistle, you kick off the ground hard, said Madame Hooch. Keep your broom steady, rise a few feet, and then come straight back down by leaning forward slightly. On my whistle, three, two. But Neville, nervous and jumpy and frightened of being left on the ground, pushed off hard before the whistle had touched Madame Hooch's lips. Come back, boy, she shouted, but Neville was rising straight up like a cork shot out of a bottle. 20 feet, 12 feet, 20 feet. Harry saw his scared white face looking down at the ground, falling away. Saw him gasp, slip sideways off the broom, and wham! A thud and a nasty crack, and Neville lay face down on the grass in a heap. His broomstick was still rising higher and higher and starting to drift lazily towards the forbidden forest and out of sight. Madame Hooch was bending over Neville, her face as white as his. Broken wrist, Harry heard her mutter. Come on, boy. It's all right. Up you get. She turned to the rest of the class. None of you is to move while I take this boy to the hospital wing. You leave those brooms where they are or you'll be out of Hogwarts before you can say Quidditch. Come on, dear. Neville, his face tear-streaked, clutching his wrist, hobbled off with Madame Hooch, who had her arm around him. No sooner were they out of earshot that Malfoy burst into laughter. Did you see his face? The great lump. <laughs> the other Slytherins joined in. Shut up, Malfoy, snapped Pravati Paddle. Oh, sticking up for long bottom, said Pansy Parkinson. A hard-faced Slytherin girl. Never thought you'd like fat little crybabies, Pravati. Look, said Malfoy, darting forward and snatching something out of the grass. It's that stupid thing Longbottom's grand sent him. The remember all glittered in the sun as he held it up. Give that here, Malfoy, said Harry quietly. Everyone stopped talking to watch. Malfoy smiled nastily. I think I'll leave it somewhere for Longbottom to collect. How about up a tree? Give it here, Harry yelled, but Malfoy had leapt onto his broomstick and taken off. He hadn't been lying. He could fly well. Hovering level with the topmost branch of an oak, he called, Come and get it, Potter. Harry grabbed his broom. No, shouted Hermione Granger. Madam Hooch told us not to move. You'll get us all into trouble. Harry ignored her. Blood was pounding in his ears. He mounted the broom and kicked hard against the ground, and up, up he soared. Air rushed through his hair, and his robes whipped out behind him, and in a rush of fierce joy, he realized he'd found something he could do without being taught. This was easy. This was wonderful. He pulled his broomstick up a little to take it even higher and heard screams and gasps of girls back on the ground and an admiring whoop from Ron. 
He turned his broomstick sharply to face Malfoy in midair. Malfoy looked stunned. Give it here, Harry called, or I'll knock you off that broom. Oh yeah, said Malfoy, trying to sneer, but looking worried. Harry knew somehow what to do. He leaned forward and grasped the broom tightly in both hands, and it shot towards Malfoy like a javelin. Malfoy only just got out of the way in time. Harry made a sharp about turn and held the broom steady. A few people below were clapping. No crab and doyle up here to save your neck, Malfoy, Harry called. The same thought seemed to have struck Malfoy. Catch it if you can, he shouted, and he threw the glass ball high into the air and streaked back towards the ground. Harry saw, as though in slow motion, the ball rise up in the air and then start to fall. He leaned forward and pointed his broom handle down. Next second, he was gathering speed in a steep dive, racing the ball, wind whistling in his ears, mingled with the screams of people watching. He stretched out his hand, a foot from the broom, ground. He caught it just in time to pull his broom straight, and he toppled gently onto the grass with the remember all clutched safely in his fist. Harry Potter! His heart sank faster than he had just dived. Professor McGonagall was running towards them. He got to his feet, trembling. Never in all my time at Hogwarts. Professor McGonagall was almost speechless with shock, and her glasses flashed furiously. How dare you? Might have broken your neck. It wasn't his fault, Professor. Be quiet, Miss Patil. But Malfoy, that's enough, Mr. Weasley. Potter, follow me now. Harry caught sight of Malfoy, Crab and Goyle, triumphant faces as he left, walking numbly in Professor McGonagall's wake as she strode towards the castle. He was going to be expelled. He just knew it. He wanted to say something to defend himself, but there seemed to be something wrong with his voice. Professor McGonagall was sweeping along without even looking at him. He had to jog to keep up. Now he'd done it. He hadn't even lasted two weeks. He'd be packing his bags in 10 minutes. What would the Dursley say when he turned up on the doorstep? Up the front steps, up the marble staircase inside, and still Professor McGonagall didn't say a word to him. She wrenched open doors and marched along corridors with Harry trotting miserably behind her. Maybe she was taking him to Dumbledore. He thought of Hagrid, expelled but allowed to stay on as gameskeeper. Perhaps he could be Hagrid's assistant. His stomach twisted as he imagined it, watching Ron and the others become wizards while he stumped around the ground carrying Hagrid's bag. Professor McGonagall stopped outside a classroom. She opened the door and poked her head inside. Excuse me, Professor Flitwick, could I borrow wood for a moment? Wood, thought Harry bewildered. Was wood a cane she was going to use on him? But wood turned out to be a person a burly fifth-year boy who came out of Flitwick's class looking confused. Follow me, you two, said Professor McGonagall, and they marched on up the corridor. Wood looked curiously at Harry. In here, Professor McGonagall pointed them into a classroom, which was empty except for Peeves, who was busy writing rude words on the blackboard. Out, Peeves, she barked. Peeves threw the chalk into a bin, which clanged loudly, and he swooped out cursing. Professor McGonagall slammed the door behind him and turned to face the two boys. Potter, this is Oliver Wood. Wood, I found you a new seeker. Wood's expression changed from puzzlement to delight. Are you serious, Professor? Absolutely, said Professor McGonagall. The boy's unnatural. I've never seen anything like it. Was that your first time on a broomstick, Potter? Harry nodded silently didn't have a clue what was going on, but he didn't seem to be being expelled and some of the feelings started coming back to his legs. He caught the thing in his hand after a 50 foot dive, Professor McGonagall told Wood. Didn't even scratch himself. Charlie Weasley couldn't have done it. Wood was now looking as though all his dreams had come true at once. Ever seen a game of Quidditch, Potter? He asked excitedly. Wood's captain of the Gryffindor team, Professor McGonagall explained. He's just the build for a seeker too, said Wood, now walking around Harry and staring at him. 
light, speedy? We'll have to get him a decent broom, Professor, a Nimbus 2000 or a clean sweep 7, I'd say. I shall speak to Dum Professor Dumbledore and see if we can't bend the first year rules. Heaven knows we need a better team than last year. Flattened in that last match by Slytherin, I couldn't look at Severus Snape in the face for weeks. Professor McGonagall peered sternly over her glasses at Harry. I want to hear your training hard, Potter, or I may change my mind about punishing you. Then she suddenly smiled. Your father would have been proud, she said. He was an excellent Quidditch player himself. You're joking. It was dinner time. Harry had just finished telling Ron what had happened when he left the grounds with Professor McGonagall. Ron had a piece of steak and kidney pie halfway to his mouth, but he'd forgotten all about it. Seeker, he said, but first year's never. You must be the youngest house player in about. A century, said Harry, shoveling pie into his mouth. He felt particularly hungry after the excitement of the afternoon. Wood told me. Ron was so amazed and so impressed, he just sat and gaped at Harry. I start training next week, said Harry, only don't tell anyone. Wood wants to keep it a secret. Fred and George Weasley now came into the hall, spotted Harry, and hurried over. Well done, said George in a low voice. Wood told us. We're on the team too. Beaters. I tell you, we're going to win that Quidditch Cup for sure this year, said Fred. We haven't won since Charlie left, but this year's team is going to be brilliant. You must be good, Harry. Wood was almost skipping when he told us. Anyway, we've got to go. Lee Jordan reckons he's found a new secret passageway out of the school. Bet it's that one behind the statue of Gregory the Smarmy that we found in our first week. See you. Fred and George had hardly disappeared when someone far less welcome turned up. Malfoy, flanked by Crabbe and Goyle. Having a last meal, Potter? When are you getting the train back to the Muggles? You're a lot braver now that you're back on the ground and you've got your little friends with you, said Harry coolly. There was, of course, nothing at all little about Crabbe and Goyle, but as the high table was full of teachers, neither of them could do more than crack their knuckles and scowl. I'd take you on any time on my own, said Malfoy. Tonight, if you want. Wizard's duel. Wands only. No contact. What's the matter? Never heard of a wizard's duel before, I suppose? Of course he has, said Ron, wheeling round. I'm a second. Who's yours? Malfoy looked at Crab and Goyle, sizing them up. Crab, he said. Midnight, all right? We'll meet you in the trophy room that's always unlocked. When Malfoy had gone, Ron and Harry looked at each other. What is a wizard's duel, said Harry, and what do you mean you're my second? Well, a second's there to take over if you die, said Ron casually, getting started at last on his cold pie. Catching the look on Harry's face, he added quickly, but people only die in proper duels, you know, with real wizards. The most you and Malfoy will be able to do is send sparks at each other. Neither of you knows enough magic to do any real damage. I bet he expects you to refuse anyway. And what if I wave my wand and nothing happens? You throw it away and punch him in the nose. Ron suggested. Excuse me? They both looked up. It was Hermione Granger. <sighs> Can't a person eat in peace in this place, said Ron. Hermione ignored him and spoke to Harry. I couldn't help overhearing what you and Malfoy were saying. Bet you could, Ron muttered. And you mustn't go wandering around the school at night. Think of the points you'll lose Gryffindor if you're caught, and you're bound to be. It's really very selfish of you. And it's really none of your business, said Harry. Goodbye, said Ron. All the same, it wasn't what you'd call the perfect end to the day, Harry thought, as he lay awake much later, listening to Dean and Seamus falling asleep. Neville wasn't back from the hospital wing. Ron had spent all evening giving him advice such as, if he tries to curse you, you'd better dodge it because I can't remember how to block them. There was a very good chance they were going to get caught by Filch or Mrs. Norris, and Harry felt he was pushing his luck, breaking another school rule today. On the other hand, Malfoy's sneering face kept looming up out of the darkness. This was his big chance to beat Malfoy face to face. He couldn't miss it. Half past 11, Ron muttered at last. We'd better go. They pulled on their dressing gowns 
picked up their wands and crept towards the tower room, down the spiral staircase and into the Gryffindor common room. A few embers were still glowing in the fireplace, turning all the armchairs into hunched black shadows. They had almost reached the por portrait hole when a voice spoke from the chair nearest them. I can't believe you're going to do this, Harry. A lamp flickered on. It was Hermione Granger, wearing a pink dressing gown and a frown. You, said Ron furiously, go back to bed. I almost told your brother, Hermione snapped. Percy, he's a prefect. He'd put a stop to this. Harry couldn't believe anyone could be so interfering. Come on, he said to Ron. He pushed open the portrait of the fat lady and climbed through the hole. Hermione wasn't going to give up that easily. She followed Ron through the portrait hole, hissing at them like an angry goose. Don't you care about Gryffindor? Do you only care about yourselves? I don't want Slytherin to win the house cup, and you'll lose all the points I got from Professor McGonagall for knowing about switching spells. <sighs> Go away. All right, but I warn you, you just remember what I said. When you're on the train home tomorrow, you're so... But what they were, they didn't find out. Hermione had turned to the portrait of the fat lady to get back inside and found herself facing an empty painting. The fat lady had gone on a nighttime visit and Hermione was locked out of Gryffindor Tower. Now what am I going to do? She asked shrilly. <laughs> That's your problem, said Ron. We've got to go. We're going to be late. They hadn't even reached the end of the corridor when Hermione caught up with them. I'm coming with you, she said. You are not. Do you think I'm going to stand out there and wait for Filch to catch me? If he finds all three of us, I'll tell him the truth and that I was trying to stop you and you can back me up. You've got some nerve, said Ron loudly. Shut up, both of you, said Harry sharply. I heard something. It was a sort of snuffling. Mrs. Norris, breathed Ron, squinting through the dark. It wasn't Mrs. Norris. It was Neville. He was curled up on the floor, fast asleep, but jerked suddenly awake as they crept nearer. Thank goodness you found me. I've been out here for hours. I couldn't remember the new password to get into bed. Keep your voice down, Neville. The password's pig snout, but it won't help you now. The fat lady's gone off somewhere. How's your arm? said Harry. Fine, said Neville, showing them. Madame Palmfrey mended it in about a minute. Good, well, look, Neville, we've got to be somewhere. We'll see you later. Don't leave me, said Neville, scrambling to his feet. I don't want to stay here alone. The bloody Baron's been passed, passed twice already. Ron looked at his watch and then glared furiously at Hermione and Neville. If either of you get us caught, I'll never rest until I've learned that the curse of the bogey squirrel told us about and used it on you. Hermione opened her mouth, perhaps to tell Ron exactly how to use the curse of the bogeys, but Harry hissed at her to be quiet and beckoned them all forward. They flitted along corridors striped with bars of moonlight from the high windows. At every turn, Harry expected to run into Filch or Mrs. Norris, but they were lucky. They sped up a staircase to the third floor and tiptoed towards the trophy room. Malfoy and Crab weren't there yet. The crystal trophy cases glimmered where the moonlight caught them. Cups, shields, plates, and statues winked silver and gold in the darkness. They edged along the wall, keeping their eyes on the doors at either end of the room. Harry took out his wand in case Malfoy leapt in and started at once. The minutes crept by. He's late. Maybe he chickened out, Ron whispered. Then a noise in the next room made them jump. Harry had only just raised his wand when they heard someone speak, and it wasn't Malfoy. Sniff around, my sweet. They might be lurking in a corner. It was Filch speaking to Mrs. Norris. Horror struck, Harry waved madly at the other three to follow him as quickly as possible. They scurried silently towards the door, away from Filch's voice. Neville's robes had barely whipped around the corner when they heard Filch enter the trophy room. They're in here somewhere, they heard him mutter, probably hiding. This way, Harry mouthed to the others, and petrified, they began to creep down a long gallery full of suits of armor. They could hear Filch getting nearer. Neville suddenly let out a frightened squeak and broke into a run. He tripped, 
grabbed Ron around the waist, and the pair of them toppled right into a suit of armor. The clanging and crashing were enough to wake the whole castle. Run! Harry yelled, and four of them sprinted down the gallery, not looking back to see whether Filch was following. They swung around the doorpost and galloped down one corridor, then another. Harry was in the lead without any idea where they were going or or where they were going. They ripped through a tapestry and found themselves in a hidden passageway, hurtling along it and came out near their charms classroom, which they knew was miles from the trophy room. <sighs> I think we've lost him, Harry panted, leaning against the cold wall and wiping his forehead. Neville was bent double, wheezing and spluttering. <sighs> I told you! Hermione gasped, clutching at the stitch in her chest. <sighs> I told you! We've got to get back to Gryffindor Tower, said Ron, quickly as possible. Oh, Malfoy tricked you, Hermione said to Harry. You realize that, don't you? He was never going to meet you. Filch knew someone was going to be in the trophy room. Malfoy must have tipped him off. Harry thought she was probably right, but he wasn't going to tell her that. Let's go wasn't going to be that simple. They hadn't gone more than a dozen paces when a doorknob rattled and something came shooting out of the classroom in front of them. It was Peeves. He caught sight of them and gave a squeal of delight. Shut up, Peeves, please. You'll get us thrown out. Peeves cackled. Ha, 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 wandering around at midnight, ickle firsties. Ta, 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 naughty, naughty, you'll get caughty. Not if you don't give us away, Peeves, please. Should tell Filch I should, said Peeves in a saintly voice, but his eyes glittered wickedly. It's for your own good, you know. Get out of the way, snapped Ron, taking a swipe at Peeves. This was a big mistake. Students out of bed, Peeves bellowed. Students out of bed down the charms corridor. Ducking under Peeves, they ran for their lives right to the end of the corridor where they slammed into a door and it was locked. This is it, Ron moaned as they pushed helplessly at the door. We're done for. This is the end. They could hear footsteps. Filch running as fast as he could towards Peeves' shouts. Oh, move over, Hermione snarled. She grabbed Harry's wand, tapped the lock, and whispered, Alohomora. The lock clicked and the door swung open. They piled through it, shut it quickly, and pressed their ears against it, listening. Which way did they go, Peeves? Filch was saying, quick, tell me. Say, please, don't mess me about, Peeves. Now, where did they go? Shan't say nothing if you don't say please, said Peeves in his annoying sing-song voice. All right, please. Nothing. Ha, ha, ha. Told her I wouldn't say nothing if you didn't say please. Ha, 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 And they heard the sound of Peeves whooshing away and Filch cursing in rage. He thinks this door is locked, Harry whispered. I think we'll be okay. Get off, Neville. For Neville had been tugging on the sleeve of Harry's dressing gown for the last minute. What? Harry turned around and saw quite clearly what. For a moment, he was sure he'd walked into a nightmare. This was too much on top of everything that had happened so far. They weren't in a room, as he had supposed. They were in a corridor. The Forbidden Corridor on the third floor. And now they knew why it was forbidden. They were looking straight into the eyes of a monstrous dog, a dog which filled the whole space between ceiling and floor. It had three heads, three pairs of rolling mad eyes, three noses twitching and quivering in their direction, three drooling mouths, saliva hanging and slippery ropes from yellowish fangs. It was standing quite still all six eyes staring at them. And Harry knew that the only reason they weren't already dead was that their sudden appearance had taken it by surprise. But it was quickly getting over that and there was no mistaking what those thunderous growls meant. Harry groped for the doorknob. Between Filch and Death, he'd take Filch. They fell backwards. Harry slammed the door shut and they ran. They almost flew back down the corridor. Filch must have hurried off to look for them somewhere else because they didn't see him anywhere, but they hardly cared. All they wanted to do was put as much space as possible between them and their monster. They didn't stop running until they reached the portrait of the fat lady on the seventh floor. 
Where on earth have you all been? She asked, looking at their dressing gowns hanging off their shoulders and their flushed, sweaty faces. Never mind that. <sighs> pig snout, pig snout, panted Harry, and the portrait swung forward. He scrambled into the common room and collapsed, trembling into armchairs. It was a while before any of them said anything. Neville, indeed, looked as if he'd never speak again. What do you think they're doing, keeping a thing like that locked up in a school, said Ron finally. If any dog needs exercise, that one does. Hermione had got both her breath and her bad temper back again. You don't use your eyes, any of you, do you? She snapped. Didn't you see what it was standing on? The floor, Harry suggested. I wasn't looking at its feet. I was too busy with its heads. No, not the floor. It was standing on a trap door. It's obviously guarding something. She stood up, glaring at them. I hope you're pleased with yourselves. We could all have been killed, or worse, expelled. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to bed. Ron stared after her, his mouth open. No, we don't mind, he said. You think we dragged her along, wouldn't you? But Hermione had given Harry something else to think about as he climbed into his bed. The dog was guarding something. What had Hagrid said? Gringotts was the safest place in the world for something he wanted to hide, except perhaps Hogwarts. It looked as though Harry had found out where the grubby little package from Vault 713 was. And that's the end of chapter nine. So that package that Hagrid took out of Gringotts, Harry is betting that's what the dog is guarding. That was a lot of running in this chapter. I feel like it was a little stressful for Harry. It was a little stressful for me reading it. I'm glad they got away from Filch. It kind of freaks me out a little. So let's read chapter 10. And this chapter is called Halloween. Malfoy couldn't believe his eyes when he saw that Harry and Ron were still at Hogwarts next day, looking tired, but perfectly cheerful. Indeed, by next morning, Harry and Ron thought that meeting the three-headed dog had been an excellent adventure, and they were quite keen to have another one. In the meantime, Harry filled Ron in about the package that seemed to have been moved from Gringotts to Hogwarts, and they spent a lot of time wondering what could possibly need such heavy protection. It's either really valuable or really dangerous, said Ron. Or both, said Harry. That is all they knew for sure about the mysterious object was that it was about two inches long they didn't have much chance of guessing what it was without further clues. Neither Neville or Hermione showed the slightest interest in what lay underneath the dog in the trap door. All Neville cared about was that he was never going near the dog again. Hermione was now refusing to speak to Harry and Ron, but she was such a bossy know-it-all that they saw this as an added bonus. All they really wanted now was a way of getting back at Malfoy, and to their great delight, just such a thing arrived with the post about a week later. As the owls flooded into the great hall as usual, everyone's attention was caught at once by a long, thin package carried by six large screech owls. Harry was just as interested as everyone else to see what was in this large parcel and was amazed when the owls soared down and dropped it right in front of him, knocking his bacon to the floor. They had heartily fluttered out of the way when another owl dropped a letter on top of the parcel. Harry ripped open the letter first, which was lucky because it said, Do not open the parcel at the table. It contains your new Nimbus 2000, but I don't want everybody knowing you've got a broomstick, or they'll all want one. Oliver Wood will meet you at tonight at the Quidditch pitch at 7 o'clock for your first training session. Professor M. McGonagall. Harry had difficulty hiding his glee as he handed the note to Ron to read. Oh, a Nimbus 2000? Ron moaned enviously. I've never even touched one. They left the hall quickly, wanting to unwrap the broomstick in private before their first lesson. But halfway across the entrance hall, they found the way upstairs barred by Crab and Goyle. Malfoy seized the package from Harry and felt it. That's a broomstick, he said, throwing it back to Harry with a mixture of jealousy and spite on his face. You'll be for it this time, Potter. First years aren't allowed them. Ron couldn't resist it. It's not any old broomstick, he said. It's a Nimbus 2000. What did you say you got at home, Malfoy? A Comet 260? Ron grinned at Harry. 
Comets look flashy, but they're not in the same league as the Nimbus. What would you know about it, Weasley? You couldn't afford half the handle, Malfoy snapped back. I suppose you and your brothers had to save up twig by twig. Before Ron could answer, Professor Flitwick appeared at Malfoy's elbow. Not arguing, I hope, boys, he squeaked. Potter's been sent a broomstick, Professor, said Malfoy quickly. Yes, yes, that's right, said Professor Flitwick, beaming at Harry. Professor McGonagall told me all about the special circumstances, Potter. And what model is it? A Nimbus 2000, sir, said Harry, fighting not to, to laugh at the look of horror on Malfoy's face. And it's really thanks to Malfoy here that I've got it, he added. Harry and Ron headed upstairs, smothering their laughter at Malfoy's obvious rage and confusion. Well, it's true, Harry chortled as he reached the top of the marble staircase. If he hadn't stolen Neville's remember-all, I wouldn't be on the team. So I suppose you think that's a reward for breaking rules? Came an angry voice from just behind them. Hermione was stomping up the stairs, looking disprovingly at the package in Harry's hand. I thought you weren't speaking to us, said Harry. Yes, don't stop now, said Ron. It's doing us so much good. Hermione marched away with her nose in the air. Harry had a lot of trouble keeping his mind on his lessons that day. It kept wandering up to the dormitory where his new broomstick was lying under his bed or straying off to the Quidditch pitch where he'd be learning to play that night. He bolted his dinner that evening without noticing what he was eating and then rushed upstairs with Ron to unwrap the Nimbus 2000 at last. Wow, Ron sighed as the broomstick rolled onto Harry's bedspread. Even Harry, who knew nothing about the different brooms, thought it looked wonderful. Sleek and shiny with a mahogany handle, it had a long tail of neat straight twigs and Nimbus 2000 written in gold near the top. As seven o'clock drew nearer, Harry left the castle and set off towards the Quidditch pitch in the dark. He'd never been inside the stadium before. Hundreds of seats were raised in stands around the pitch so that spectators were high enough to see what was going on. At either end of the pitch were three golden poles with hoops on the end. They reminded Harry of the little plastic sticks muggle children blew bubbles through, except they were 50 feet high. Too eager to fly again to wait for wood, Harry mounted his broomstick and kicked off from the ground. What a feeling. He swooped in and out of the goalposts and then sped up and down the pitch. The Nimbus 2000 turned wherever he wanted at his slightest touch. Hey, Potter, come down! Oliver Wood had arrived. He was carrying a large wooden crate under his arm. Harry landed next to him. Very nice, said Wood, his eyes glinting. I see what McGonagall meant. You really are a natural. I'm just going to teach you the rules this evening. Then you'll be joining team practices three times a week. He opened the crate. Inside were four different sized balls. Right, said Wood. Now Quidditch is easy enough to understand, even if it's not too easy to play. There are seven players on each side. Three of them are called chasers. Three chasers, Harry repeated as Wood took out a bright red ball about the size of a football. This ball's called the quaffle, said Wood. The chasers throw the quaffle to each other and try and get it through one of the hoops to score a goal. Ten points each time the quaffle goes through one of the hoops. Follow me? Okay, the, the chasers throw the quaffle and put it through the hoops to score, Harry recited. So that's sort of like basketball on broomsticks with six hoops, isn't it? What's basketball? said Wood curiously. Never mind, said Harry quickly. Now there's another player on each side who's called the keeper. I'm the keeper for Gryffindor. I have to fly around our hoops and stop the other team from scoring. Three chasers, one keeper, said Harry, who was determined to remember it all and they play with the quaffle. Okay, got that. So what are they for? He pointed at the three balls left inside the box. I'll show you now, said Wood. Take this. He handed Harry a small club, a bit like a rounder's bat. I'm going to show you what the bludgers do, Wood said. These two are the bludgers. He showed Harry two identical balls, jet black and slightly smaller than the red quaffle. Harry noticed that they seemed to be straining to escape the straps holding them inside the box. 
Stand back, Wood warned Harry. He bent down and freed one of the bludgers. At once, the black ball rose high in the air and then pelted straight at Harry's face. Harry swung at it with the bat to stop it breaking his nose and sent it zigzagging away into the air. It zoomed around their heads and then shot at Wood, who dived on top of it and managed to pin it to the ground. <sighs> See? Wood panted, forcing the struggling bludger back into the crate and strapping it down safely. The bludgers rocket around trying to knock players off their brooms. That's why you have two beaters on each team. The Weasley twins are ours, and it's their job to protect their side from the bludgers and try and knock them towards the other team. So you think you got all that? Okay, three chasers try and score with the quaffle. Keeper guards the goalposts. The beaters keep the bludgers away from their team. Harry reeled off. Very good, said Wood. Er, have the bludgers ever killed anyone? Harry asked, hoping he sounded offhand. Never at Hogwarts. We've had a couple of broken jaws, but nothing worse than that. Now the last member of the team is the seeker, and that's you. And you don't have to worry about the clawful or the bludgers. Unless they crack my head open. Don't worry, the Weasleys are more than a match for the bludgers. I mean, they're like a pair of human bludgers themselves. Wood reached into the crate and took out the fourth and last ball. Compared with the quaffle and the bludgers, it was tiny, about the size of a large walnut. It was bright gold and had little fluttering silver wings. This, said Wood, is the golden snitch. And it's the most important ball of the lot. It's very hard to catch because it's so fast and difficult to see. It's the seeker's job to catch it. You've got to weave in and out of the chasers, beaters, bludgers, and quaffle to get it before the other team's seeker because whichever seeker catches the snit wins his team an extra 150 points, so they nearly always win. That's why seekers get fouled so much. A game of Quidditch only ends when the snitch is caught, so it can go on for ages. I think the record is three months. They had to keep bringing on substitutes so the players could get some sleep. Well, that's it. Any questions? Harry shook his head. He understood what he had to do all right. It was doing it that was going to be the problem. We won't practice with the snitch yet, said Wood carefully, shutting it back inside the crate. It's too dark. We might lose it. Let's try you out with a few of these. He pulled a bag of ordinary golf balls out of his pocket, and a few minutes later, he and Harry were up in the air. Wood throwing the golf ball as hard as he could in every direction for Harry to catch. Harry didn't miss a single one, and Wood was delighted. After half an hour, night had really fallen, and they couldn't carry on. That Quidditch couple have our name on it this year, said Wood happily as they trudged back up to the castle. I wouldn't be surprised if you turn out better than Charlie Weasley and he could have played for England if he hadn't gone off chasing dragons. Perhaps it was because he was now so busy, what with Quidditch practices three evenings a week on top of all of his homework, but Harry could hardly believe it when he realized that he'd already been at Hogwarts two months. The castle felt more like home than Privet Drive had ever done. His lessons, too, were becoming more and more interesting now that he had mastered the basics. On Halloween morning, they woke to the delicious smell of baking pumpkins wafting through the corridors. Even better, Professor Flitwick announced in charms that he thought they were ready to start making objects fly, something they had all been dying to try since they'd seen him make Neville's toad zoom around the classroom. Professor Flitwick put the class into pairs to practice. Harry's partner was Seamus Finnegan, which was a relief because Neville had been trying to catch his eye. Ron, however, was to be working with Hermione Granger. It was hard to tell whether Ron or Hermione was angrier about this. She hadn't spoken to either of them since the day Harry's broomstick had arrived. Now, don't forget the nice wrist movements we've been practicing, squeaked Professor Flitwick, perched on top of his pile of books as usual. Swish and flick, remember, swish and flick. And saying the magic word properly is very important too. Never forget, wizard Burfio, who said S instead of F and found himself on the floor with a buffalo on his chest. It was very difficult. Harry and Seamus swished and flicked, but the feather they were supposed to be sending skyward just lay on the desktop. Seamus got so impatient 
that he prodded it with his wand and set fire to it. Harry had to put it out with his hat. Ron at the next table wasn't having much more luck. Wingardium Leviosa, he shouted, waving his long arms like a windmill. You're saying it wrong, Harry heard Hermione snap. It's Wingardium Leviosa. Make the guard nice and long. You do it then if you're so clever, Ron snarled. Hermione rolled up the sleeves of her gown, flicked her wand and sang Wingardium Leviosa. Their weather, their feather rose off the desk and hovered about four feet above their heads. Oh, well done, cried Professor Flitwick, clapping. Everyone see here, Miss Granger's done it. Ron was in a very bad temper by the end of the class. It's no wonder no one can stand her, he said to Harry as they pushed their way into the crowded corridor. She's a nightmare, honestly. Someone knocked into Harry as they hurried past him. It was Hermione. Harry caught a glimpse of her face and was startled to see that she was in tears. I think she heard you. So, said Ron, but he looked a bit uncomfortable. She must have noticed she's got no friends. Hermione didn't turn up for the next class and wasn't seen all afternoon. On their way down to the great hall for the Halloween feast, Harry and Ron overheard Parvati Paddle telling her friend Lavender that Hermione was crying in the girl's toilet and wanted to be left alone. Ron looked still more awkward at this, but a moment later they had entered the great hall where the Halloween decorations put Hermione out of their minds. A thousand live bats fluttered from the walls and ceilings, while a thousand more swooped over the table in low black clouds, making the candles in the pumpkin stutter. The feast appeared suddenly on the golden plates as it had at the start of term banquet. Harry was just helping himself to a jacket potato when Professor Quirrell came sprinting into the hall, his turban askew and terror on his face. Everyone stared as he reached Professor Dumbledore's chair, slumped against the table and gasped, <sighs> Troll in the dungeons! Thought you ought to know! Then he sank to the floor in a dead faint. There was an uproar. It took several purple firecrackers exploding from the end of Professor Dumbledore's wand to bring silence. Prefix, he rumbled, lead your houses back to the dormitories immediately. Percy was in his element. Follow me, stick together, first years, no need to fear the troll. If you follow my orders, stay close behind me now. Make way, first years, coming through. Excuse me, I'm a prefect. How could a troll get in? Harry asked as they climbed the stairs. Don't ask me, they're supposed to be really stupid, said Ron. Maybe Peeves let it in for a Halloween joke. They passed different groups of people hurrying in different directions as they jostled their way through a crowd of confused Hufflepuffs. Harry suddenly grabbed Ron's arm. I've just thought, Hermione. What about her? She doesn't know about the troll. Ron bit his lip. Oh, all right, he snapped, but Percy better not see us. Ducking down, they joined the Hufflepuffs going the other way, slipped down a deserted side corridor, and hurried off towards the girls' toilets. They had just turned the corner when they heard quick footsteps behind them. Percy, hissed Ron, pulling Harry behind a large stone griffin. Peering around it, however, they saw not Percy, but Snape. He crossed the corridor and disappeared from view. What's he doing? Harry whispered. Why isn't he down in the dungeons with the rest of the teachers? Search me. Quietly as possible, they crept along the, long, the next corridor after Snape's fading footsteps. He's headed for the third floor, Harry said, but Ron held up his hand. Can you smell something? Harry sniffed and a foul stench reached his nostrils. A mixture of old socks and the kind of public toilet no one seemed to clean. And then they heard it a low grunting and the shuffling footfalls of gigantic feet. Ron pointed at the end of the passage to the left. Something huge was moving towards them. They shrank into the shadows and watched as it emerged into a patch of moonlight. It was a horrible sight. Twelve feet tall, its skin was dull granite gray, its great lumpy body like a boulder with its small bald head perched on top like a coconut. It had short legs, thick as tree trunks, with flat, horny feet. 
the smell coming from it was incredible. It was holding a huge wooden club which dragged along the floor because its arms were so long. The troll stopped next to the doorway and peered inside. It waggled its long ears, making up its tiny mind, then slouched slowly into the room. The key's in the lock, Harry muttered. We should lock it in. Good idea, said Ron nervously. They urged towards the door, mouths dry, praying the troll wasn't going to come out of it. With one great leap, Harry managed to grab the key, slam the door, and lock it. Yes! Flushed with their victory, they started to run back up the passage, but as they reached the corner, they heard something that made their hearts stop. A high, petrified scream, and it was coming from the chamber they'd just chained up. Oh no, said Ron Pale as the bloody barons. It's the girl's toilet, Harry gasped. Hermione, they said together. It was the last thing they wanted to do, but what choice did they have? Wheeling around, they sprinted back to the door and turned the key, fumbling in their panic. Harry pulled the door open. They ran inside. Hermione Granger was shrinking against the wall opposite, looking as if she was about to faint. The troll was advancing on her, knocking the sinks off the wall as it went. Confuse it, Harry said desperately to Ron, and seizing a tap, he threw it as hard as he could against the wall. The troll stopped a few feet from Hermione. It lumbered around, blinking stupidly to see what had made the noise. Its mean little eyes saw Harry. It hesitated, then made for him instead, lifting its club as it went. Oi, pea brain, yelled Ron from the other side of the chamber, and he threw a metal pipe at it. The troll didn't even seem to notice the pipe hitting its shoulder, but it heard the yell and paused again, turning its ugly snout towards Ron instead, giving Harry time to run around it. Come on, run, run! Harry yelled at Hermione, trying to pull her towards the door, but she couldn't move. She was still flat against the wall, her mouth open with terror. The shouting and the echoes seemed to be driving the troll berserk. It roared again and started towards Ron, who was nearest and had no way to escape. Harry then did something that was both very brave and very stupid. He took a great running jump and managed to fasten his arms around the troll's neck from behind. The troll couldn't feel Harry hanging there, but even a troll will notice if you stick a long bit of wood up its nose and Harry's wand had still been in his hand when he jumped. It had gone straight up one of the troll's nostrils. Howling with pain, the troll twisted and flailed its club with Harry clinging on for dear life. Any second, the troll was going to rip him off or catch him a terrible blow with the club. Hermione had sunk to the floor in fright. Ron pulled out his own wand. Not knowing what he was going to do, he heard himself cry the first spell that came into his head. Wingardium Leviosa! The club flew suddenly out of the troll's hand, rose high, high up into the air, turned slowly over, and dropped with a sickening crack onto its owner's head. The troll swayed on the spot and then fell flat on its face with a thud that made the whole room tremble. Harry got to his feet. He was shaking and out of breath. Ron was standing there with his wand still raised, staring at what he had done. It was Hermione who spoke first. Is it dead? I don't think so, said Harry. I think it's just been knocked out. He bent down and pulled his wand out of the troll's nose. It was covered in what looked like lumpy gray glue. Ugh, troll boogies. He wiped it on the troll's trousers. A sudden slamming and loud footsteps made the three of them look up. They hadn't realized what a racket they had been making, but of course someone downstairs must have heard the crashes and the troll roars. A moment later, Professor McGonagall had come bursting into the room, closely followed by Snape with Quirrell bringing up the rear. Quirrell took one look at the troll, let out a faint whipper, and sat quickly down on a toilet, clutching his heart. Snape bent over the troll. Professor McGonagall was looking at Ron and Harry. Harry had never seen her look so angry. Her lips were white. Hopes of winning 50 points for Gryffindor faded quickly from Harry's mind. What on earth were you thinking of? said Professor McGonagall with cold fury in her voice. Harry looked at Ron, who was standing with his wand in the air. You're lucky you weren't killed. Why aren't you in your dormitory? Snape gave Harry a swift, piercing look. Harry looked at the floor. 
He wished Ron would put his wand down. Then a small voice came out of the shadows. Please, Professor McGonagall, they were looking for me. Miss Granger! Hermione had managed to get to her feet at last. I went looking for the troll because I, I thought I could deal with it on my own, you know, because I've read all about them. Ron dropped his wand. Hermione Granger telling a downright lie to a teacher. If they hadn't found me, I'd be dead now. Harry stuck his wand up its nose and Ron knocked it out with his own club. They didn't have time to come and fetch anyone. I was about to finish me off when they arrived. Harry and Ron tried to look as though the story wasn't news to them. Well, in that case, said Professor McGonagall, staring at the three of them, Miss Granger, you foolish girl, how could you have think of tackling a mountain troll on your own? Hermione hung her head. Harry was speechless. Hermione was the last person to do anything against the rules, and here she was, pretending she had to get them out of trouble. It was as if Snape had started handing out sweets. Miss Granger, five points will be taken from Gryffindor for this, said Professor McGonagall. I'm very disappointed in you. If you're not hurt at all, you'd better get off to Gryffindor Tower. Students are finishing the feasts in their houses. Hermione laughed. Professor McGonagall turned to Harry and Ron. Well, I still say you were lucky, but not many first years could have taken on a full-grown mountain troll. You each win Gryffindor five points. Professor Dumbledore will be informed of this. You may go. They hurried out of the chamber and didn't speak at all until they had climbed two floors up. It was a relief to be away from the smell of troll, quite different from anything else. We should have got more than 10 points, Ron grumbled. Five, you mean, once she's taken off her moinies. Good of her to get us in trouble like that. Get us out of trouble like that, Ron admitted. Mind you, we did save her. She might not have needed saving if we hadn't locked the thing in with her, Harry reminded him. They had reached the portrait of the fat lady. Pig snout, they said, and entered. The common room was packed and noisy. Everyone was eating the food that had been sent up. Hermione, however, stood alone by the door, waiting for them. There was a very embarrassed pause, then none of them looking at each other. They all said, thanks, and hurried off to get plates. But from that moment on, Hermione Granger became their friend. There are some things you can't share without ending up liking each other, and knocking out a 12-foot mountain troll is one of them. So, that's the end of chapter 10. Oh, I love Harry Potter. So, your assignment for these two chapters together is a choice assignment. You can choose to either draw me a picture of the mountain troll, or you can draw me a picture of the three-headed dog. It is up to you. But I would like the picture to be at least a full page size. So, like this, at least a full page. Use all your space. I don't want a lot of negative space on there. And I would like you to color this picture for me, please, and post it to Fresh Grade. All right. I will talk with you soon. Bye.